Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man. Today on Think Tech Hawaii, Stan Osterman here, coming to you live and direct from the mighty megalopolis of Kailua, Hawaii. And um, I've got a really, really, not just a good show today. Um, when we started putting this thing together, I decided we need to make at least three shows out of it. So this is going to be part one of a three-part series. And it's based on a webinar that was done by Sustainable Energy Hawaii last Saturday. And we'll have the link to that webinar up uh, on their website uh, probably by tomorrow. And I, I really highly encourage everybody to check the whole webinar out because what we're going to show on this show and the next show is just some of the segments of uh, PowerPoint done by one of our guests today, um, Peter Sternlich, who, who is a media guy by trade and did an outstanding job of encapsulating what I think is the macro to the Hawaii specific energy situation and all the moving parts that go with it. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna start off by showing the first couple of minutes of his, it's a PowerPoint that he's narrating and it'll start you off with the kind of the, the big world picture. Um, and we'll do a second segment after we have a chance to discuss the first segment a little bit. And then we'll we'll finish up in the next two shows for the next two weeks, uh, next two Tuesdays, and get this thing going. So our guests today are going to be um, Richard Ha. He's a local businessman from the Big Island, uh, farmer by trade, and lifelong born and raised uh, Big Island uh, guy. And Peter Sternlich, who, uh, who is also from the Big Island and been there for a long time. And both of them are super uh, energy people and super local Kama'aina attitude, got to be good for everybody, including the rubber slipper guys, or we don't do it at all. So Sustainable Energy Hawaii is the organization that they're representing. And uh, if we can, well, let's get started with the first video, then Richard and Peter and I will get into a discussion. Modern Energy 101. Albert Einstein famously said, everything is energy, and that's all there is to it. This isn't philosophy, it's physics. The science of physics defines energy as the capacity to do work. Regardless of the form that's used, energy literally is what powers everything we do in life. Curtail any of what's in use today and the entire system begins to weaken. At Sustainable Energy Hawaii, we believe it's essential our community have a greater overall understanding about energy. Due to the climate emergency, major decisions are currently being made about our energy future. The question of whether they're sustainable over the long term isn't really a discussion we've had in depth yet. To that end, we're convinced geothermal has a prominent role to play in our energy future. Today, there's a race to decarbonize the global economy. The lion's share of this effort is focused on solar and wind in combination with battery storage. All of these are valuable, essential, and achievable near-term solutions. At SEH, we wholeheartedly support these efforts. However, we know that solutions with longer life cycles are critical as well. Hawaii has very different energy challenges compared to those being confronted on the large continental land masses. Each Hawaiian island is small, isolated, and the physical space that can be devoted to renewable energy production is limited or in conflict with other public, private, or cultural interests. None of our islands have interconnected grid systems, and the relatively small size for each power plant keeps them from enjoying the economies of scale seen elsewhere in the world. These conditions and more contribute to the high price we all pay for power. So. Oh. As we as we finish up that piece of video, welcome Richard, welcome Peter, and Peter, that's an awesome job you did on on that segment. Uh, you also had some great speakers and great guests, and a, a nice segment by Richard Ha on the on the whole webinar. So I hope folks get a chance to look at that webinar when it's up on your website and and get a, a good look at it. I think we're also going to include the the link for just your um, presentation in whole not chopped up like we're doing for the show here. So people can look at it a couple times because, you know, I've been trying to focus my shows on the macro level, the, the global level of energy, how much oil there is, how much natural gas there is, and how critical the resources are to our daily lifestyle and what we've quote unquote become accustomed to with travel and cars and price of gasoline and things like that. 
And I really, really believe that most of the people on this planet, especially in our country, don't realize how spoiled they are by the availability of cheap energy. And it's not always going to be that way. And Hawaii needs to start planning now to the future to get a clean, sustainable energy future going. And we're already behind the power curve. We need to be moving on this. Um, whether you believe in climate change or not, the supply of oil is limited. And we fight uh, a, a race to get our infrastructure, our clean infrastructure built before we start getting really expensive oil, making our infrastructure even more expensive. So welcome, Peter, and welcome, Richard. And uh, Richard, I I'd like you to kind of introduce us a little bit to um, Peter. Uh, you've been on my show before, and um, you grew up in Hawaii and have family roots that go way back generations. Um, how's, how important is this topic of sustainability to you? Well, it's extremely important. I, I met Peter through uh, Robert Rapier. He's a mutual friend of ours. And uh, so we've been uh, engaged in this subject for more than 10 years, and Peter before that. Um, yeah, so when we, we talk to each other, we're talking the same exact language, yeah. So now we're bringing it down to uh, how it applies to us here in Hawaii. You know, we're keeping an, uh, an eye on what's the world situation, but we're bringing it down to Hawaii. And so is um, Nate Hoggins also uh, a one of your um, musketeers in your sustainability discussions? Does Peter know? Does Peter know Nate very well? Yeah, we 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 all know Nate. You know, and what what I like about Nate's uh, uh, point of view, he 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 realizes how serious this is. But his uh, take on it is, how do we bend but not break? You know, so so it's a it's a reasonable you know, and we've been looking at this for a while yeah it's a reasonable way to go and you know even if we're wrong that you know there's no harm no foul in what we're doing exactly exactly so peter you know i i really i can't overstate how much i appreciate your your production and even the the uh, trailer that you sent that uh, we're not going to show on the show here for obvious copyright reasons but um that that piece of work is exceptional. And I, I think it's something that everybody in the world should be seeing. So I hope we can somehow drum up enough resources to let you do the full full length feature of that um, and see if we can get it going because it's really important. But, you know, give us your view on sustainability on a global scale and on the Hawaii scale. Well, that's, that's a very, very good question. I mean, in, in terms of just the definition of sustainability, Sustainability is something that in my mind, and, and I think is inherent in its own de definition, is something that's long term. Um, our global economy is one that is based, that expects continuous growth. This is a finite planet, continuous growth is not possible. So sustainability means that the way that we have gone about um, essentially financing the way we live has to change. And this goes to, you know, what Richard was talking about in terms of um, the research and work that Nate Hagens has been doing, because the work that Nate is doing now is really focused on mindset, on how people look at their surroundings at and what their expectations are. I think the reality is, is that everybody is going to be living with less stuff. And um, it, it, we can get into this in terms of energy, but the amount of available energy to, to create and do the work that is being done in the world today is going to start contracting. There's, it, it, it's, it, the people who research this stuff know that to be true. It's just not, it's not public it's it's not uh, conventional wisdom yet. You know, so um, I I've I've had Nate on my show, mm -hmm. and he he uses the term energy blindness. He says that people just don't realize how much energy they use, and and he has an example where he's standing in front of some of the things he has on his farm. He's standing next to his horse, and he says, you know, I I can do about one seventh of the work of this horse in terms of energy. And the horse can do about a, a third or a quarter 
of what my quad can do. And then my truck is 150 horsepower. It can do 150 times what my, my horse can do. And when you put it in those terms, people start to, to visualize that energy is all about getting work done. And we are so used to having fuels that are energy dense, like oil, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, to move airplanes at hundreds of miles an hour across oceans and continents. And we take that for granted. Um, in my show last week, I asked my guest how much he really valued oil at, and he said $10,000 a barrel in terms of actual work that can be done by that oil and products that can be made. But we we just suck the oil out of the ground and burn it like it was free. And it's not free. It is a finite resource. But I know further on in your video, and you'll, you'll, you'll see it and you'll talk about it, what is your view of the value of oil? Um, you know, how much energy is in oil? Well, if you if you look at the at, at, at the energy that's contained in a barrel of oil, um, I think it's a, a fairly common metric that a barrel of oil is the equivalent of four and a half years of human labor. Um, so I think if you properly value human labor over four and a half years, you're going to come up with a figure that's way higher than $10,000 a barrel. Um, it, it is the densest, it is the most concentrated form of energy that, that we have. There's, um, we did some calculations and there's 12,500 kilowatt hours in a cubic meter of petroleum, which is about half a barrel. Um, so so for, for my house, I use 21 kilowatt hours of electricity every day. So mm -hmm. start to compare those numbers and realize where we would be if we didn't have an energy dense fuel. And it is a finite resource. We're going to be running out. So Richard, if you didn't have a tractor on your farm, how many more people would you have to hire to dig trenches, clear land? If you couldn't use tractors and pumps and, and equipment like that, what kind of impact would that have on your productivity on your farm? You know, um, we ran a uh, hydroponic tomato operation and we produced a million pounds annually. Now, if we didn't have the help of uh, um, machinery, I, I cannot. I cannot imagine. You know, there, there's no way we could. We could. Uh, Produce that much, and we produce that much on twenty acres. So, so it, it's a, it's it's a threat to our ability to grow enough food. That that is the problem. And and I think that's the whistle that Nate's blowing, is that people have to understand, like Peter says, that as oil gets more and more expensive, we may have to go back to more on manual human labor, or do without certain things because we won't be able to afford the energy to do what we do now, un unless we can find something more sustainable. And that kind of leads us towards the direction of maybe a clean thing, like some people say nuclear. Um, that's not a real popular choice, but it is clean. It's non-carbon. It's, it's very, very long lived. We, we have the resources, but it's not safe as we produce it now. So it'd have to change, the, the systems would have to change. But then we have hydroelectric, and Richard, I know you have hydroelectric on your farm um, that produces electricity. And one thing that we have that we, we use on the big island, uh, unlike the other islands in Hawaii, is geothermal. Puna Geothermal produces, I think they're up to like 38 kilowatts of, uh, of um, production or megawatts of production out of their geothermal wells. And the technology is getting cleaner and better uh, with horizontal drilling and stuff so that you know, people are starting to take geothermal on the Big Island and even on Maui and Oahu a little more seriously. And I'm sure we're going to have more discussion on that later on in the show. But let's can we roll the, the second uh, segment of the video now and uh, and talk a little bit about that? Modern Energy 101. To put the potential of geothermal power into context, we should take a broad look at the basics of energy and then evaluate our expectations as humanity goes through its first major energy transition in more than a century. At the outset, it's important we understand that not all energy is created equal. 
By this I mean we use distinctly different types of energy to satisfy different needs, each requiring different concentrations of raw power. Broadly, there are three well-defined forms of energy used to support civilization as we know it. For example, we have one form that's specifically used for transportation, another that powers static infrastructure, such as our homes, commercial buildings, and public spaces, and then a third, often left out of the energy category altogether, food. Transportation is primarily powered by petroleum and tends to come in various types of liquid fuel. Gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and marine gas oil are good examples. Even with the advent of EVs, 96% of all transportation used to move people and goods around the world is still powered by liquid, petroleum-based fossil fuels. Today, there is no alternative at scale. Solar cannot power container ships. Windmills cannot power the mining equipment needed to secure the raw materials used to build renewable systems in the first place. This should begin to illustrate the scale needed to transform global energy supplies to renewables, especially if continuous growth on a finite planet remains the default business model. Our second energy type is electric power. At its most basic, generating electricity has been very simple. We've just needed some kind of continuous flowing force to spin a turbine generator. In recent history, that's come from burning fossil fuels like coal, natural gas, or petroleum to produce the heat needed to boil water. That in turn produces pressurized steam that spins power generating turbines. Current data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration shows that 61% of U.S. power production still comes from fossil fuels. The remaining 39% are renewables and comes from a mix of hydro, nuclear, wind, solar, and biofuels. Even though renewable energy growth is quite strong, it's only projected to satisfy a little more than half of the growth in overall energy demand during 2021 and 2022. The rest will come from increased fossil fuel use. The third type of energy I want to discuss today is the energy that powers you and me and all of our domesticated animals, food. Today it's estimated that 90% of the food consumed across the Hawaiian Islands arrives by petroleum-powered cargo ships. Virtually all that food is grown using some combination of equipment and fertilizers that is derived from fossil fuels. So as we as we finish up that segment the things that really stand out for me are your definition of your three major types of energy that being for transportation liquid fuels the grid electricity and food for us and the first law of thermodynamics pops into my head and says energy is not created or destroyed it just changes form so the sunlight and the and the water and stuff is trans is transformed in plants to the food we eat or the grass that the cows eat and we eat the cows um, but we harvest oil from the ground that was that took millions of years to to make and and we can't replace it but we have 96 percent of our transportation is still oil based on fuel and guess what? I think that some of the electric transportation that makes up that last 3% of electric transportation is probably powered by an oil grid. So even there, we, we have a long ways to go. How do, you, how do you recommend that we try and do this transition? And what is the challenge of getting to that you know, grid parity where electric transportation is not going to drive us broke trying to put charging stations and things at every house or all over the world and up, upgrade our grid. I think people don't realize that we'll have to probably double the production and the scale of our grid to meet the transportation needs that if we go electric, no matter whether we use hydrogen or, or whatever, but at least hydrogen, you can produce it near the, the renewable resource and then use it like gasoline, like a liquid fuel. But what's your picture of that, Peter? How, how do we, how do we, cover that gap? How do we start growing where we need to grow? That's a, that's a really, really good question because um, honestly, I, I, I think about the scale involved um, and I, it, I, I don't 
I, it's hard for me to see how that actually succeeds on a global level. Well, can you do it with is, just solar and wind? Well, I don't know. I don't think so. Because I don't think so either. I, and, I really don't think that's possible. I mean, the, 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 the issue is, is that we have a global economy. It's a centralized production and stuff has to move. Um, I mean, you saw the picture of there were two there were two um, graphics. One showed the tanker transportation that delivers 100 million barrels of oil every single day. And the other graphic showed the marine traffic. That was a real time capture. You know, like you can you can do the same thing with airplanes. That was a real time capture of the global marine freighter traffic moving stuff around. And what's What's kind of shocking to me is that we're talking about just-in-time logistics for almost all of it, um, it, it and it, it just the scale the scale is incredible and and the way that we've grown that scale and I I don't want to I don't want I, I don't to kind of filibuster here but it's like my father was born in 1921 it took 300,000 years for the po human population to reach 1.8 billion people. In 100 years, we've added 6 billion more to that number. And everybody wants stuff. And I just, it, 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 my, my feeling is, is that we need to focus on Hawaii. That Hawaii, I mean, we got to, just like on an airplane, they tell you if the oxygen mask comes down and you've got a, you've got a small child sitting in your lap, you put your mask on first then you take care of the baby. And that's how I feel about, you know, getting our energy um, house in order, which is we need to focus on Hawaii. And we have a blessing, a, an incredibly lucky resource here that can boil water for a long time and we don't have to buy it. it it's sitting right here and that's geothermal energy. I agree with you. There is no way we can put enough wind turbines and solar power uh, even ocean OTEC, ocean thermal, which we have available, we we need it all. We need solar, we need wind, we need ocean turbines, we need OTEC. But geothermal is the one thing that Hawaii is literally blessed with. I mean, you can thank Madam Pele for one of the most awesome resources on our planet to get Hawaii sustainable in the future. So, Richard, along that line, you know. Hawaii is blessed with geothermal power. It's probably the only thing that can bridge that gap to renewable energy, unless we bring nuclear in, which I don't think most of the people here would, would want to do right away. What do you think the, the Hawaiian community would say if we wanted to introduce geothermal as a viable place to get us into the clean energy future? I think, I think the uh, 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 native Hawaiian the people, you know, once we sit down and, and discuss the situation and talk about it in terms of what's what are we trying to do for future generations, I, I think we'll all be able to uh, come together and start to move in the toward the future. Because the, the simple part about geothermal is number one, only 1% 1 of the world has it, and we're so lucky. But imagine we're going to be sitting over the hotspot for one to two million years. That's a little bit like forever. <laughs> it's going to be long after I'm gone, that's for sure. Yeah, and but, the other thing, too, is that the, the heat and steam is free. All you got to do is stick a pipe down there, and the, and, and the pressure of the steam coming up spins a turbine. So, so in other words, we're talking about if uh, electricity that's stable price for that, that length of time. So it's such a such a, a a blessing. It's incredible. So we just need to talk about it, and that's what uh, we're doing with our uh, uh, ground, uh, I'm sorry, geothermal webinars. Yeah. Yeah. And we're basically taking the heat, converting it into electricity. The energy is just changing form, like I said, with the first law of thermodynamics. And because there is so much heat left in the in the earth, that'll go many many hundreds of years past us. I'm sure that. By then, we'll be mining Mars or some other planet for, for minerals and for uh, energy and things like that. Or we'll have another technology that can take its place long before we ever look at expending all the energy from the Earth's 
core, the Earth's heat, Madame Pele's hotspot. You know, it, it's like Hawaii has everything it needs to be sustainable, just as the Hawaiians had 500 years ago. And they even used geothermal for cooking, as I understand it. Back in the early days, up on the mountain, they would cook food on the steam vents on Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. So I just see it as a natural. I, I see it as something I hope we can we can continue to talk with everyone and, and work out the uh, details, uh, be, make people comfortable with the safety aspects. I mean, you and I have all looked at some horizontal drilling from modern geothermal systems and uh, and I think we're there where we can we can do it safely, cleanly, environmentally safely, take up a much smaller footprint than than we would if we were doing solar and wind. And nobody wants to see wind turbines on every hillside in Hawaii. Um, you know, so I think geothermal is a really strong candidate. So we've got a couple of two minutes left. Um, I'll, I'll leave it up to um, you, Peter, to kind of close us out. And um, we're going to have you back next week, and we'll we'll look through some of the rest of that that uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's essentially, you know, the the energy that I mean, one of the blessings and one of the benefits that we have, and and this is sort of how I describe the nature of Hawaii to my friends in Los Angeles, is the state of Hawaii only has one area code. We're fairly low population. And so we, the resources that we have, which are water and sun and geothermal, we have the ability to produce the energy we need here. But it's going to take, it's going to take uh, making it a priority because we don't have a lot of time. Um, there are projections about, about the rate at which fossil fuel energy is going to start contracting. And it's not that far into the future. I mean, we have, you know, it, we're, we're already seeing it now. Oil is, oil is pushing $100 a barrel. That's re recessionary in terms of its price because the cost of energy bakes into every single thing we consume. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really a matter of, the entire state pulling together and realizing we got to get serious about tr and transportation fuel is the big deal because everything we use comes by boat. And at some point they're going to come less often. Right. Richard, um, uh, in a couple seconds, do you think hydrogen plays a role in this big equation with geothermal and transportation energy? Absolutely. Uh, and hydrogen takes, uh, uh, it generates heat, and it take, you know, and it allows us to do stuff that we can't do with just electricity. You know, if we start to talk about ammonia, we, we can't just make ammonia from electricity. But if we go to hydrogen, we can get to ammonia. If we get to ammonia, we can, that fertilizer, and not only fertilizer, it's 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 a, a, a fuel you can use in uh, legacy type uh, uh, plants. You know, so so. The fact that we're sitting on, on, on this resource that, that can make green uh, electricity at a stable rate, sooner or later, we'll be more competitive to the rest of the world. Right. Well, I thank you, gentlemen, for being on today. And we're going to do part two next week. And I'm looking forward to that. So for everyone here on, the, on Think Tech Hawaii, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next week, Tuesday. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.